Kathy. Great job. Okay. Uh, our well, uh, I'm really very excited about the next um, talk from Jaya and Fernando. Come on up. Uh, they're doing. They're working on personalization systems at Netflix. And uh, for us, uh, me personally, the uh, Netflix Plus was um, immensely popular in, in, in bringing personalization uh, at forefront. And it was an inspiration for us at Zillow because we launched uh, Zillow Prize um, and a one million dollar prize. Where we're um, evaluating the, the winners now. And so that was a big inspiration. The other inspiration from Netflix uh, was the multi arm bandits, which is becoming very popular for uh, automated A-B testing. And great, you guys have a great paper. And I'm super excited about you going to talk about that here. And um, with that, thank you. And thank you. Maybe I should stand here. <laughs> okay, so hi everyone. I'm Jaya Kavli, and together with my colleague Fernando, we will talk about a multi arm bandit um, approach for recommendations at Netflix. So, as you all know, and are probably very happy Netflix subscribers, uh, Netflix provides a subscription service to allow members to watch content online. Uh, so the goal of the Netflix homepage is to quickly allow members to find the content that they would like to watch. The risk is that if they do not find the content that they would like to watch quickly, the members can lose interest and even cancel the subscription. The challenge is that we are a global company. We are spread across 200 countries. There are more than 125 million member base. So even though we have global members, we need to cater to personalized taste. So as you would have guessed, the uh, recommendation systems form a heart of the Netflix homepage. So let's have a small quiz. Can you spot the algorithms on the Netflix homepage? All right. As you would have already guessed, um, we have algorithms for everything. We have algorithms for search. We have algorithms for what to show on the billboard, which is the big banner that you see on the Netflix homepage. We have algorithms for what images to show for the titles on the Netflix homepage. We have algorithms for what evidence or what, uh, what title description that we sh should show for the, for the title. We have algorithms to rank the rows on the Netflix homepage, even rank the titles within the Netflix homepage. So in this talk, we are going to focus upon two main case studies. The first case study is artwork personalization. So the goal of artwork personalization is to recommend uh, an artwork or imagery for a title to help the members decide if they are going to watch the title or not. And the second case study that we are going to focus on is billboard recommendation. So the goal of the billboard, which is the big banner that you see on the Netflix homepage, is to uh, successfully introduce new content on the Netflix homepage. OK. So uh, as you would have already known, there are several traditional approaches for recommendation that have been very successfully applied in various industrial settings. One of the most popularly used approaches is collaborative filtering-based approach. So the idea of collaborative filtering-based approach is to use the wisdom of the crowd to make recommendations. It is very well understood and practiced, and there are a variety of algorithms that exist. Uh, some of the most popularly one, used ones are the matrix factorization-based techniques. So even though these traditional approaches for recommendation are very popularly used uh, in various industrial settings, they come, face several challenges when applied to a real-world setting such as ours. For example, we have the case of very scarce feedback. The catalog itself is dynamic and keeps on changing. This is because new titles can get added to the service. 
Now, the country availability of titles can also impact what can be shown to a different member. So the, also, the member base itself is non-stationary, meaning that members join the service, members could leave the service, and so on. So there is a time sensitivity aspect to all of this um, because the content popularity changes over time, the user's interests evolve over time, and what we need is to respond quickly to the member feedback. So what we exactly need is an algorithm which is continuous and fast in learning. Uh, so multi arm bandit approaches have been very popularly used in various other practical settings where these challenges occur. For example, in clinical trials to determine which medicine to give to a patient, in the case of network routing where you want to route a packet in the network, in the case of online advertising where you want to show the right advertisement for the member, uh, in the, even in the case of AI for games and also hyperparameter optimization. So what exactly are these multi-arm bandit techniques? So the idea of multi-arm bandit techniques is somewhat derived from the idea of uh, gambling in a casino. So imagine that there is a gambler who's playing multiple slot machines with unknown reward distribution. So the goal of the gambler is to collect as much reward as possible. So which slot machine should the gambler play in order to maximize his earnings? Note that the reward distribution for these slot machines is unknown. Because if it were known, then all the gambler has to do is just play the machine with the highest expected reward. So, how do these uh, multi arm bandit algorithms proceed? So, at the heart of these algorithms is the exploration versus exploitation uh, trade off. That is, whether you should utilize uh, the knowledge so far and recommend the most optimal title in the case of recommendation, title recommendation, which is exploit, or whether you should try to gather more feedback about some unknown arms or some unknown titles in the case of title recommendation, that is explore. So these multi arm bandit techniques have been like widely studied in the literature. There are numerous variants that exist. Now, these multi arm bandit techniques can be classified according to different categories. For example, the different strategies that can be used for multi arm bandit algorithms, whether they are epsilon greedy, Thompson sampling, upper confidence bound, etc. So, uh, another such categorization is what is the environment in which these multi arm bandit algorithms operate? For example, the environment can be assumed to be stochastic and stationary, in which the reward is assumed to be generated IID from a specific uh, distribution for an action for, or for an arm, and uh, there is no payoff drift which is assumed. Or, on the other hand, are the adversarial multi arm bandits in which you make absolutely no assumptions about the reward distribution. Um, you can also try to optimize for different objectives, for example, whether you want to try to optimize for cumulative regret or tracking the best expert. Now you can have continuous versus discrete set of harms. You can have finite versus infinite set of harms. Um, there are two uh, uh, specific extensions that we are particularly very interested in. One is the uh, varying set of arms, because in our case, um, in the case of like image optimization or even in the case of billboard recommendation, new titles can get added to the service, so the number of arms itself is varying. And the second one is the contextual bandit, in which we have some context or the feature vector coming in from the user and the item which can be further utilized for the recommendation process. So uh, without further ado, let's move on to the first case study, which will be covered by Fernando. Thank you, Chaya. Let's see. Okay. So hi, everyone. I'll be explaining kind of the first use case of the multi bandit that Jaya explained. And as she said, it's kind of, I guess, very easy to describe. So we have, in this case, uh, nine images for uh, Stranger Things, the show. And so basically, we want to kind of make a model that learns, basically, 
which image we should show for each user. So let's say, you know, when you come to the service or your spouse comes to the service, you actually probably will see different images for the same show. Um, and actually, this fits really well into the multi arm bandit kind of um, framework or description. And we have here kind of a classical diagram of the framework. And basically, for us, the actions will be just the set of images, so it will be finite. Um, then, of course, the reward, I mean, you can define it in many different ways, but an easy one is basically how many minutes the user played after showing that image. That's easy to log and understand from the service. Um, the environment for us is extremely controlled, so it's the app or the homepage of Netflix. So that's, I guess, a, a good thing. And uh, basically what we want to do is to maximize, as usual, the number of uh, minutes that, you know, overall, across all sessions, the users are going to play. So this is kind of the basic setup. And before I describe in detail in each of these different elements, I'll try to give you kind of a little view of like the specific challenges for this application. And so the main one is basically attribution. So you know what we really want to learn is whether this image you know kind of help you understand the title and made it, made it play. And one difficulty you know within the service is that actually the kind of the algorithm that selects the image sits on top already of another recommendation algorithm. So it's going, you know, and for example, in, in a famous title like The Godfather, you have two very different images, you know, one kind of describing the title itself, the other one presenting one of the most famous uh, actors, you know, in the movie. And then it turns out you play the movie, will you have played it anyways, no matter the image we showed, or did the, the, the image actually help you in that, in that decision? And um, so, you know, trying to decipher this, the problem is also we can only show you one image at a time. We cannot just kind of quickly flip around. So we'll have to find, you know, this kind of causality only from this um, showing different images one at a time to the different users. And the other problem basically is what we call the change effect, which is basically, let's say you come to the, to the service once, you know, and we showed you one, the Marlon Brando image, and you didn't play the, the title. Then you come the next day, you know, what should you do? Should we switch to the other image because we didn't play? Or should we kind of double down and, you know, and use the persistence to, to sell the, the title? Um, and if you go to Reddit or talk to people, there will basically be opinions for, you know, for both cases uh, and what to do. So you would like to actually learn from the data what is the best thing to do in, you know, for, for this problem. And so just, oops, uh, oh yeah. And so basically, um, you know, aside from these challenges, I'll, I'll show now, as I said, the specific things uh, within the framework. So probably the most important things for us are the actions, which are the images. And um, one very big difference in, in our setup versus other multi arm bandits is that actually we have control of these actions. So it's kind of kept within Netflix. We have designers, you know, that will come up with these images. So we can kind of design the, the actions as part of the optimization problem. So what kind of images do we want? How many of them do we want for each shows? Things like this. And just as a, you know, I guess general learnings we've had in this space is basically, so, or some of the guidance is, once is mm, basically, um, it has to be representative. So of course, you know, it has to show something meaningful about the show. I mean, it's very easy to create clickbait images, but we are not, you know, in that business. We want the user to click and be happy about what they discovered. The second one is, of course, each image has to be different from the previous one. So, you know, if all the images in The Godfather are about Marlon Brando, you're not going to basically learn much from image to image. So you have to represent really different themes or different actors and actresses. Um, and the last two ones is kind of where the contextual multi arm bandits will really come because they are much more subjective for users, which is basically the image has to be informative about the title and it has to be engaging. And yeah, as you can imagine, these two words mean very different things for different people. And so just some examples, you know, kind of some of the dimensions you can explore these, uh, these traits. The first one will be uh, kind of thematic. So we have a, a movie here called The Quiet American, which is, you know, has some action related to war, but also sh has some kind of romance underlying theme uh, and plot in the movie. So you can imagine you have two very different images for the same title, but that represent the very different themes. And since we know what the users have watched, you know, in the past, you will try to guess basically w in which theme they are interested for, for this movie. 
Another dimension you can explore, of course, you know, is the cast, uh, actresses and actors uh, that are famous. And Pulp Fiction is kind of a you know, very classical example because it has a lot of different, different famous people. So, you know, depending on the viewing history of the user, you can basically, you know, show Emma Thurman or, you know, um, John Travolta or Bruce Willis and the list goes on. And so these are just two examples of, you know, things that you will, you will kind of emphasize in the different images. And so as Jaya mentioned, oh, there's no, okay. As Jaya mentioned, um, there are a lot, you know, the literature is very vast and very rich in uh, different approaches on uh, the how to solve the multi bandit. I'll just present here one of kind of the simplest one is good for illustration and um, kind of for understanding the, the setup, which basically is you have the Netflix user that comes to the service. And basically for that session, you roll a dice, you know, and with probability epsilon, basically you will show them a random image for that show. So if you think about it, this, this is what is called the explore. And it's kind of a micro A-B test for that session. It's fully randomized. And so basically, you will be collecting unbiased data that you will use then, you know, if, they, if they probably, with probability 1 minus epsilon, the user will have gone to exploit, which basically, basically means we'll try to show the best image so far, you know, that we know for, for them. And what that we know so far means basically from the explore collected data. And this epsilon value is going to basically control the, the trade-off, you know, between explore and, and exploit. And so for the exploit part, of course, you can also think of many other things or many ways, you know, um, you can create, if you want a softmax uh, with all your actions and then throw all your favorite deep learning on it. Um, and, you know, many other things, but one possible approach, you know, and easy to interpret is, so the user come now, they are in exploit. You know the context of the user and, kind of each, you have the pool of uh, images or actions. So you can actually learn a model um, for basically for each of your assets and basically score when the user comes, you quickly score you know, each of the assets with that model and basically pick the one with highest probability. Um, and that will be basically a greedy, uh, greedy policy. So this is you know, just some examples of how you can you know, solve the, the problem. But of course, one of the main things you need are metrics. That's basically what's going to tell you, you know, how well you're doing, how you're going to optimize uh, the models you're building. And again, there are many different possibilities. I'll be happy to talk offline, you know, of different metrics. But kind of one very simple one that you can measure is, let's say we have three users that were presented the, you know, the, look, the same look cage image. And you know that, of course, in the logins that they were presented this image, and you know who played and who didn't play. So you can define what we call the take fraction, which is basically in the denominator, you know, you had basically three uh, users shown the image and you know one played. So it's one, th your take fraction is one third. It's kind of the probability, you know, in average that somebody plays the, the image when you show it. And the advantage of this metric um, is basically that you can also calculate it offline, not only online. And Again, there's quite a rich literature in this topic. Uh, it's called replay or inverse IPS, inverse propensity scoring. And what you have basically to do it offline is you know you, you know the the explore data you have collected. You have you know the random assignments with the probabilities. And now let's say you come up with your new latest you know fancy model. So you can kind of replay it. This is where the came model uh, the model name comes. Um, so you know you. Basically, with the historical data, you try to see what the new model will have assigned. And for the places where you know, the real assignment and the new model didn't match, you cannot say anything. You don't know what will have happened if you had shown that image. But for the places actually where it matches, you actually know if they play or not. So you, you can calculate again this take fraction with your historical data. So in this case, it will be two thirds because three match match and two of them had played. And so what uh, this offline analysis allows is really a much faster iteration, so you can really filter what goes to A-B testing or online with much less effort. Um, and it's, you know, it has basically a pretty good predictive value of what is going to happen it's, uh, online. So it's a pretty useful tool. And so basically, you know, this is what we did. We tried a lot of many different things that you can think of. 
And this is what is going to be shown on the graph on your right. Or basically, the y-axis is the take fraction, this offline take fraction. And so the, the first bar, of course, is your absolute baseline, which is the take fraction if you show random images. Hopefully, your algorithm does better than that. Um, and so that's the first bar. And then the next bar is basically multi-arm banded, so with no context, which what means for us is basically you just pick the, for each title, you just pick the image that is most, more popular. So basically, from your explored data, you measure take fraction, and everybody will see whatever is most popular. You can see already, you know, the, the uh, take fraction has a nice lift. And then, of course, you know, surprise, surprise, actually, of course, uh, context matter. So it can be from location, device, time of the day, you know, what the user has played before, anything you, any context you want to throw at it, that gives you an extra, you know, an extra lift. And so, aside from, you know, from uh, the obvious, uh, basically, one very important thing was diversity. As I mentioned at the beginning, Basically, for the multi-arm bandit to be able to really kind of shine, you need each of the, your assets to have very different rewards. Otherwise, you know, it doesn't matter if you show one image or the other, if they don't have different rewards for different uh, segments of the population. Um, and the other thing is basically that a good image is always a good image, and a bad image is a bad image, <laughs> in the sense that basically all the, or the contextual or the personalization is going to do is kind of wiggle around the most popular images. You know, if a bad image doesn't appeal to anybody, it's not going to be shown no matter what. Um, and so I'm happy to say, you know, this was actually rolled out into production, so you should all, you know, if you go back to your Netflix profile and check somebody else's profile, you should see different... Uh, images for the same show, and some of the extra learnings we, you know, we had when we kind of went online is that it actually seems to benefit mostly the unknown titles, which, if you think in retrospect, it's obvious, but <laughs> it was not at the beginning, because yeah, everybody knows The Godfather, so you don't need to give much context. But if the movie is really unknown, the the image is going to be kind of one of the main impressions of the user uh, to the, make the decision. And then, of course, um, there's quite a bit of work to be done, and there is actually an active um, literature and research, which is basically some of the, well, the metric I explained is kind of at the title level. But you have to think that these images now go all into the service in a page where you see all the images at once, and they are kind of competing one with another. So in some sense, the metrics should be a little bit, I mean, not smarter, but basically it just should be joint metrics at a kind of whole page level to take this cannibalization effect uh, into consideration. And so I'll return the microphone to Jaya so she can explain the second uh, example. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, so let's look at the second case study, which is billboard recommendation. So as we already said, the goal of the billboard is to successfully introduce new content to the users. So. What if we try to apply the greedy exploit policy that Fernando just mentioned into the billboard recommendation space? So there are a few more questions that we need to be careful about and that we need to answer. For example, in the case of explore, how should we organize the explore? How should we uh, allocate the bandwidth for exploration? This is because there is a cost associated with show showing a suboptimal title to a member on the billboard. So. And what should we focus on? Should we focus on new titles, or should we focus on the existing titles as well? Uh, new titles obviously uh, need cold start and would benefit probably much more from exploration as compared to the existing titles. So uh, also in the terms of exploit, we need to answer several questions, like how should we look at like model synchronization? How should we handle title availability? What should be the frequency of model updates? How frequently should we update the model? whether we should go for incremental or batch models. Um, there is also this non-stationarity aspect of like title popularities, and how should we take that into account into the modeling itself? So let's first uh, quickly apply uh, the greedy exploit policy that Fernando mentioned into the billboard space. So what we have is a member coming on the Netflix homepage. Uh, we have a candidate pool now. The candidate pool consists of the list of titles that are eligible to be shown to the member. So we extract the features of the member and the title pair. We already have four different models for the four different titles. 
we compute the probability of play for the member for the different titles. And finally, we select a winner depending upon the title, which maximizes uh, the probability of play for the title for the member. So a key question which is often asked in recommendations is, did the member play the title because we showed it to them, or whether they would have played the title anyways? So if you think about it, this question is really important in the realm of the Netflix homepage, because the Netflix homepage is an expensive real estate, and there is a cost associated with promotion. So. Um, there are so many titles to promote, and there are so few opportunities to win the moment of truth. So uh, imagine over here that a user is binging on the series Dark. So every day he comes in, D1 to D5, he comes in and he plays, let's say, an episode of the, of the series. So his probability of play every day in the evening is very high for this title. Does that mean every day we should show him the same title again and again on the billboard? Probably not. So traditional correlational systems take an action uh, just depending upon if the probability of play is very high without taking into uh, the irrespective of the base reward rate. However, what we need to model over here is the incremental effect of taking an action. So let's switch gears a little bit and try to understand this concept of incrementality. So this concept of incrementality has been studied in advertising. So in case of advertising, the goal of incrementality is to measure ad effectiveness. So what you do is uh, you randomly divide your population into control and treatment group. In the control group, you show uh, other people's advertisements. And in the treatment group, you show your own advertisements. And finally, uh, incrementality is the difference in the conversion in the treatment group and the control group. So that actually tells you the causal effect of showing an advertisement to the members. So let's try to bring this concept of incrementality into the billboard space. So what we want to do over here now is to select a title from promotion that benefits the most from being shown on the billboard. So note that the members can play the title from anywhere else on the home page as well. We only control the algorithm for the billboard, but popular titles tend to appear much more on the home page anyways. For example, Trending Now, Popular at Netflix, there are different rows which try to capture that. Um, so it might be better to utilize the most expensive uh, real estate on the home page a little bit better. So what we want to do is define a policy which is incremental with respect to the probability of play. So what does this mean, basically? So our goal is to recommend a title which has the largest additional benefit from being shown on the home page. So given that you know how the home page is organized, you want to find the title which has the largest additional benefit from being shown on the billboard. So what you want to do right now is recommend a title not on the basis of the probability of play, but on the basis of the delta probability of play, where the delta is basically the difference in the probability of play when the title was shown on the billboard versus when the title was not shown on the billboard. So just to understand this a little bit better, so which titles would benefit the most from being shown on the billboard? So this figure over here shows a scatter plot for the probability of play for three different titles, um, A, B, and C, um, the probability of play and the incremental probability of play for the three different titles. So as you see, the title C over here is probably a very popular title, and it has a very high baseline probability of play. On the other hand, uh, 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 but it has a very low incremental probability of play, which means that it doesn't benefit as much from being shown on the billboard. The baseline probability of play is itself very high. It's a popular title, so maybe we don't need to show it on the billboard. On the other hand is title A, which has a very low probability of play, but 
whose incremental probability of play is very high, which means that it will benefit much more from being shown on the billboard. Uh, we also did an online and offline comparison of the two policies, the greedy exploit policy and the incrementality-based policy. So what we saw offline was that, as you would expect, the incrementality-based policy sacrifices replay by selecting a lesser-known title which would benefit from being shown on the billboard. Uh, we did the experimentation online as well, and what we saw was that our implementation online was able to shift the engagement of in the candidate pool from a very popular title to some other title which would benefit much more from being shown on the billboard. So, uh, so far we have seen that uh, we have a generic, we defined a generic framework for um, the multi arm bandit at Netflix. We had two example case studies, the artwork optimization and the billboard recommendation using that framework. Our framework is generic and um, allows us to experiment with different uh, multi arm bandit strategies, different reward functions, and um, it opens the door for several research directions. So very, the very first uh, research direction that uh, we want to focus on and that we want to understand better is the action selection orchestration. So if you think about it, the problem of billboard recommendation or the problem of artwork, um, artwork optimization are not the problems which occur in isolation. They occur within the realm of the Netflix homepage. So how the neighboring titles are organized also influences the user in selecting a title uh, which is recommended. So how can we utilize that better? So the example over here shows two different rows for the same titles with different images which have been selected. So the first row consists of like all diverse set of images. And the second row, which we call as the microphone row, consists of like all the characters holding a microphone. So maybe some users prefer the microphone row better as compared to some users which prefer a diverse row much better. So we cannot just optimize for a title at an individual level, but we need to look at the neighboring images as well when we come up with this artwork optimization. Uh, our next research direction uh, focusing on the images is to generate automatic images. So generating like the candidate arms for images um, manually is a time-consuming process, as you would have guessed. So, can we come up with an algorithm which directly tries to predict the asset quality from the raw image, and then use that as candidates for our image optimization? Finally, what we care about as a company is not just plays or clicks, but we care about long-term joy for a member. So how can we use that, uh, how can we use our framework to capture these long-term rewards, and which opens the door for a reinforcement learning kind of algorithms, and how can we actually even capture this long-term joy as a reward? So these are some of the open questions that we definitely like to answer in the future. With that, we've come to the conclusion. Thank you very much. To define the signals, right. like to define the features. Right. So we, yeah. So the features could be anything. Like you, yeah. We don't like specifically restrict ourselves to any kind of features. Like, yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering. It seems like everything you're doing is dependent on identifying the person that's viewing what the material you're showing on. And uh, I'm wondering if you know what percent of people actually accurately identify who they are. And if you're using techniques like tracking how they move the mouse, if they're using a laptop to identify the user 
even if they don't self-identify or anything like that. So, yeah, yeah go ahead, I think. No, it says, so this is all within the Netflix homepage. So we know exactly, you know, it's, an, it's a closed environment, basically. So, so the person has to log in to access the, the environment. But they could be using someone else's login. I don't know what the frequency of that is. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. a different resource problem yeah, in itself. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's also sharing of profiles yeah. and all of those right. things. Um, yeah, still a research direction. For, for now, yeah. you know, it's within the profile. You know, things like mouse, how people move the mouse sure. is a signature. So we can yeah. use, start to use things like that. Yeah. yeah. There are like yeah, tons of things like we can use, like people use different devices differently. People react to recommendations differently on different devices. People like to watch different titles differently on different devices and so on. So definitely, yeah, these are all like open research questions that we want to answer. Might get a bimodal distribution yeah. Yeah. Say, yeah. yeah. So th that could be like another research problem in itself to identify like whether there are bimodal distributions or more distributions and like how would you like cater to different profiles which or different users which are lo using the same profile at different times and so on. Yeah, I have a question here. Have, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, thanks. Very interesting work. I'm just wondering if you can share more detail about the context of when the errors that you were using, like uh, did you use any like image features and uh, metadata meta feature from the image and how effective they are? <laughs> I mean, as you can imagine, I, we cannot share ex you know exactly all the details. All the things you mentioned are definitely in the model. You know, they are useful. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, you can imagine. All, so especially the metadata. You know, so these the images or the billboards suffer from cold start problem same as any other recommendation. So that's something that you have ahead of time before you have other signals. So definitely useful. Uh, you show that for each uh, title, you have a model, right? So if I understood correctly. So you have a map for each title with uh, the arms of basically the images, right? That's one. Uh, on, uh, uh, my question is, uh, obviously it means that, you know, okay, so you have, I don't know, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of maps. What about, uh, so if their context, they get the user signals, right? For the users, you have, I guess, different set clusters of users that each map belong to. Could you talk about that more? Right? Uh, um. Meaning that in order to get, you know, if you have uh, different maps for different user segments. I mean, so I, d I don't think, you know, we don't, uh, we don't have really like a, I mean, well, like a cluster or hard cluster. You can imagine, so those, con those features, so like, I don't know, in the case of the images or the tags or what you've watched in the, pla in the past, you know, this all goes into the model and the model implicitly, I mean, creates this cluster. You know, I, I won't be able to tell you, I don't know, People that have watched romantic movies at 9 a.m. get these images. I mean, it's a very high dimensional space, and, and that's what the model, I mean, I guess what the model learns. If you want to call them clusters, or, I mean, uh, but it's not that we specifically. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, I, yeah. Or, or we can discuss offline. Yeah. Uh, uh, my question uh, do you use online training or offline training? And have you considered train a simulator for the environment? Sorry, so, I didn't. So, so, so yeah. if we do offline or online training? Yeah, on, on, online training, I mean, it's an RL, right? Do you use online training like you put the agent in production before it actually learn anything, and then it start, you know, serving the customer, and then, oh, and then learn the okay, same or you create a some kind of simulator who that yeah. simulate what the user may behave. I think that uh, like Alibaba has done that, like they create a simulator of their marketplace. So, so which uh, approach do you use? We, 
Well, yeah, well. I can probably talk about that. Like, so we ex we experiment with like all kinds of different things in online training versus offline. Uh, like batch training is one thing that we experiment with, and it's it's definitely very useful to have like some kind of online training, especially for cold starting titles. Like on the in the in the billboard space, like when you want to cold start titles, you want the model to be as reactive as possible to the user feedback. So probably at that time, like online training like helps much more, um, but. Uh, we also experimented with like batch kind of training. Those uh, models are also like good when you have like certain popularity which has been established for the titles. Um, uh, so thank you so much for this great talk. A lot of information and very um, you know to ground and, and super super great. Uh, I have a question around the, when you're doing the online experimentation. How the collaboration from you know data scientists to research <laughs> to product, <laughs> how much control you are having? You know, I want to change the model from yesterday to the, the today. Potentially, you know, that can reduce the traffic by fifty percent. I'm just you know painting a very dark image here. And how much of the uh, collaboration negotiation with product team you guys are having? Very interesting. Yeah. Do you want me to take a shot? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> so, okay, so first of all, you know, we are yeah. in a sense independent yeah, contributors. We are not managers, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, at least I, I feel um, Netflix is pretty lean in that sense. It, I think anybody, when they develop, whether they are data scientists or engineer, they have the mindset that what they are writing can go to production one way or another, and they try to kind of minimize the barriers you know, and whether you're using whatever, a Python library or R or, you know, Spark, that anything can go to production. So in general, there's not such a hard division. Um, like the person usually developing the model will, I mean, will collaborate with some more like, I guess, traditional software engineer app person to put it in the stack. But um, there's, you know, there are things in place to make it as frictionless as possible and basically that you can iterate very quickly instead of you know somebody doing some kind of toy model that then has to be handed to somebody else to put it in production. Yeah. So at least for Jaya and me in particular, we do the modeling, but we also do the code that goes in production. And so there is basically zero friction in, in that sense. Let me I would like to add one more sentence that we are, uh, our team is called algorithm engineering. Yeah. Yeah. So we inherently <laughs> do everything. <laughs> yeah. I so. guess it's, yeah. yeah. Let me ask this. Just a specific question on, on top of that. So you you clearly have the uh, the AB frame. You've integrated the AB frame or the multi arm bandit on that expensive real estate, as you call. And it, how's that? How did you get to that point working with the product teams? Uh, yeah. How, 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 how did you get how to that? How did we put the multi arm bandit in place? You in know, so so like with the product team. Okay. So like we are the product. Team. <laughs> 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 um, I mean, it, I, th I think you can read. Well, we read, or at least when we were setting up. I read a few blogs of other companies that had done it. I, you can set it up roughly with three, four people, in, in the sense like, you know, so you need somebody from kind of the login side or the client, you know, UI client side to be able to log, you know, whatever you, so what image was displayed or what billboard was displayed. You'll probably need a data engineer that, you know, kind of collects all those logins, does the proper joins and those things. Okay. And then you have a, like a research, I mean, research, pr I mean, engineer. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, but there was alignment and then the teams worked yeah, yeah, but, to but that. Yeah, yeah, but it's that. that it's not that you need like, I don't know, 20 people to, co you know, to coordinate. Uh, okay. Question, do you take into account events or information that are outside the Netflix platform? For example, the new Jurassic Park movie is going to uh. be released, now you start showing the older Jurassic Park movies for, for people that want to see those. Um, but it, wh wh how is this from outside the net? So there is a new movie release, yeah. so it's not Netflix platform, but now Netflix may start showing oh. the older Jurassic Park movies sure. because of that. So do you take that into account? I mean, you will, s well, uh, well, you will see that mm -hmm. in the data in general, so there are very classical, you know, yeah, when, yeah. when movies are released, like, I don't know, the new Captain America movie is released, I don't think you need to do anything special, like, you know, you see a spike basically of people yeah. starting watching, and and if your systems are reactive enough, you you'll just pick it up without any special 
kind of you know information from outside or like I mean, unfortunately, when Robbie Williams died, you know, you will just see a spike of people rewatching, you know, all, all his movies. So, but in general, is that if if you have some sort of online or batch thing that is reactive enough, um, it will pick it up by itself. I don't know. Yeah, I think I agree with that. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thank oh. you. Uh, okay, we'll do one more question. We can. Uh, was there another question? Okay, go ahead. Last question. Yeah, yeah. So we definitely have the continue watching row, for example, that would definitely show you the title that you have been binge watching. But on the other hand, like maybe we can show you some other title and utilize the real estate better. Like otherwise, we would just be repeating the title like everywhere. So it might be better to, like, yeah, yeah, make you more aware. Like maybe even uh, like subtly aware of that other title, which is available on the service. Thank right. you, Jaya and Fernando, and Thank a great, you. great Thank talk. You. Awesome job, guys. Time, it's time for time for lunch. Oh, so, <laughs> let's go have lunch, and we'll come back in about an hour. <laughs>